Hello, this is Raskas. We're looking at lab 5.1A. It's called Inspector Ionic and Constable Covalent. This is a lab that I wrote and designed myself from scratch. Um, reworking a couple of labs that investigate the properties of covalent and ionic solids. So I've put this into the context of uh, an investigation where there's been a break-in in a chemical lab and two chemicals have been stolen. But we have three suspects and each suspect has two chemicals, but a different two. In all, we have three chemicals. The objective is to identify the culprit by identifying the substances because we've been given the formulas and the structures of the three solids, two from the lab and one that was not in the lab. <clears throat> we know those three are the three unknown substances, A, B, and C. We just don't know which is which. So to sum up, in this lab, we'll be looking at three unknown substances, A, B, and C. We know that one of these is ionic, one is covalent, nonpolar, and one is polar covalent. By investigating their physical properties, we will try to identify which one is polar, nonpolar, and ionic, and therefore match these to the known compounds. <clears throat> I'm going to go through in this video the first part of the lab, which is the experiment itself. Part B is where we do all the reasoning and deduction and solve the case. So here's what the document looks like that we'll be working out of. <clears throat> Inspector Ionic and Constable Covalent. Here's the background I mentioned. Um, in the introduction or background information part, there are some questions here for you to answer. There are videos in my slides where you can find the answers to these. And this is to prep you for understanding what we'll be dealing with. And so that you can make good hypotheses based on some knowledge and understanding for each of the three tests we're going to do. <clears throat> so let's talk about apparatus and materials. Materials are the things that get used up. Those are the three substances, A to C, which are in random order, these three chemicals that we have listed there. We're also going to use water and apparatus. Uh, oh, we also need to use foil. Apparatus are the pieces of equipment that we use that can be used over and over. So we'll use a measuring cylinder. We'll use beakers. We'll use a spoon or stirrer, a pair of tongs or tweezers to remove the foil from the hot plate. Hot plate. And one more thing I don't have in front of me right now is a conductivity meter, which tests the electrical conductivity. All right, let's get into it. First test is the test of melting point. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to mold the small pieces of aluminum foil foil into boats. By that, I just mean put some sides on it so that when the substance melts, it doesn't run all the way out. Thinking about variables, <clears throat> in, any experience, in any experiment, you have to have one independent variable, which means your input, what is changing each time, what's different each time. For this one, that would be the substance is different each time. That's an independent variable. Your dependent variable, is what you're looking for in the output. We are testing to see <laughs> melting point. We're not measuring the melting point directly with a thermometer. We're gonna apply heat to it and see how long it takes to melt. So technically our dependent variable is the time taken to melt. Your control variables should be everything else that could possibly affect your dependent variable, but that you want to keep consistent. So we wanna keep the amount of heat energy supplied consistent, <clears throat> or at least the rate at which heat energy is supplied, we want to keep that consistent. And we want to keep the 
amount of substance that we put in consistent. And we want to keep the, <clears throat> the way that we place that substance or expose that substance to the heat consistent. So we're going to try to make these three pieces of aluminum identically folded. Easy way to do that. I use uh, one of the small beakers that we have. Just put it in the center, fold the aluminum up the side. You get a nice flat base. You want that flat base so that you can get good conduction between the hot plates and the foil. <clears throat> By using the same beaker, you're gonna get them the same exact size and shape. Foil has a shiny side and a dull side. I just happened, I wasn't paying too much attention. I just happened to put the shiny side outside. So I'll just do that consistently for all three of them, just in case that might make a difference. All right, okay, I've made my three foil boats. <clears throat> I wanna put a consistent amount of substance in it. I wanna make sure that I keep track of where I put the substances, meaning which substance I put in which. So I'm going to have A in the back and then B and C, B on the left, C on the right. I want to put just one small scoop. We don't want to put too much because then it might take too long to melt. So put a little bit of A. I'm going to put half of a scoop and spread it around on the base of the foil. If we put it in a pile, the bottom might start to melt and we mightn't see it because it might be covered by solid <clears throat> substance still. I try to shake that around so it's spread out so I can see it when it melts. Now I want to make sure I don't cross contaminate so I'll wash my spoon each time in between. That's an example of a precaution that we take. In science, we always take precautions. We take safety precautions as well as precautions to make sure we get accurate results. So on the topic of precautions, precautions is you're going to wear safety goggles for this when you're heating stuff up. Um, we have our tongs or tweezers to take stuff off of the hot plate. Um, going to wear an apron, safety apron. And... Uh, hair tied back, although you don't have any open flames. All right, those are safety precautions. Now, in terms of accuracy, we want to try to have, like I said, about the same amount of substance, at least the same amount of coverage of the base. We want to have that spread around, not piled up. <clears throat> we want to put all three on at the same time. Because if we did one first and then took it off and did the other, the hot plate would already be hot from the first one um, when we put the second one on. And we are timing how long it takes to melt. But the hot plate would have started off cold for the first one. So for a fair trial, we need to put them all on at the same time. I'm starting my hot plate from cold. I'll start timing and put it on. If we're starting it from cold, just so it doesn't take too long, I'll put it on 7 If the hot plate has been on for a while, or if you have time to put it on before, I put it on four and then put put the substances on after it's heated up. And then we observe and we're going to look for melting. Melting means turning from a solid to a liquid. <laughs> now we can see Substance B has started to melt already. We're clearly seeing some of those white granules turn into liquid. You see a whole bunch of liquid there. So it's definitely melting. Now, we don't want to leave this on for too long because then it will start to actually burn. We're trying to get a physical change, not a chemical change. 
It's pretty much all melted. I'm going to go ahead and take it off. If you start to see smoke or if you see a color change, it means that that's a chemical change. And that means it's, that means it's beyond melting now. It's burning, but we've got it all melted. It's been just about one minute. And B is all melted. So that was the first one to melt. Substance, let's see. Substance C seems to be melting as well. Or is it? Actually, it's it's fizzing, it's popping, it's jumping around. So that's interesting. Substance A. It's difficult to see, but it looks like substance A. I'm not sure. So substance C. We're seeing what looks what appears to be some sort of bubbling, fizzing. But is it melting? Still seems to be solid. <clears throat> We're seeing something looking like liquid coming out of it. But is the substance itself melting? Now, what this could be, some substances have what is called the water of crystallization. They are tiny water molecules that get caught in between the molecules of the substance when it dries out, if it was made from a, an aqueous solution. When you heat those substances up, those water molecules vibrate until they break free. They turn to gas and they they exit. Sometimes they fizz. Sometimes they cause popping, very similar to what would happen in popcorn. So it appears substance C had some water of crystallization, but after heating for quite a bit, it is still all solid. It seems like all the fizzing has stopped, but we still have solid here. Compare that to substance A which at this point has clearly started to melt. It's almost all liquid. It's starting to turn color a little bit right now, so I'm going to take it off. That means we have a chemical change about to start. We don't need that. So it's been about three minutes, three and a half minutes. Substance A has just melted. Substance B melted after one minute. Substance C is still on there. It fizzed for a bit. It has stopped fizzing. And it is still solid. From my experience, you can leave this on for 10 minutes. It'll still be solid. So we'll just see substance C did not melt. Make sure to take all, all the foil off with the tongs, not with your hands. And then we're going to turn off the heater, unplug it, push it out of the way, and... Stay away from it while it cools down. Now, I forgot to talk about the hypothesis. So let's go back to the document for just for a little bit. For each of these tests, we're going to have a hypothesis. And I say before carrying out the test, compose a hypothesis about what result you expect for an ionic compound, polar covalent compound, and non-polar covalent compound. So we do not know what A or B or C is. We do not know what each of these substances is. Um, so we cannot make a hypothesis about what we expect A to do or B or D or, or C. We can say what we expect for each type of substance. So your hypothesis will be ionic substances we'll expect to melt first or melt last or not melt at all. Polar covalent substances, what will we expect to happen? Non-polar, what, what will we expect to happen? Uh, in class, I ask you to justify your hypothesis by reference to intermolecular forces. So, for example, non-polar substances have only LDFs, which are the weakest type of intermolecular forces, which means that they are very weakly held together. Therefore, it should be easiest to separate them. Therefore, we expect them to melt first. So, I, our hypothesis will be the non-polar substance will melt first because it has the weakest intermolecular forces, LDFs. <clears throat> you can follow that format and say what you expect for polar and for ionic substances. Test two is test of solubility. I give you some videos or you can look up online to see what you'd expect for a non-polar substance, a polar covalent substance, and an ionic substance when mixed with water. 
Water, of course, is a polar covalent compound. And so you should be able to find in the course resources some information that will help you to formulate this hypothesis. This one is very simple. We measure about 50 milliliters. I'm not too worried about the exact measurement. And I use this as an opportunity just to reinforce the proper use of measuring cylinders. So for example, you wanna put your measuring cylinder on a flat surface. You want to get down to eye level and measure the bottom of the meniscus. I have 25 ml cylinders and I'm trying to get 50 ml in each beaker. So that gives six opportunities to make this measurement. So students get some practice. Like I said, I'm not too worried about it. It doesn't make a huge difference if it's off by a mill milliliter or two or five. It's not really that big of a deal. It's just practice. Once we have equal amounts of water in each of the three beakers, then we'll start one by one trying to dissolve the substances. Okay, so I have equal amounts of water in each of these beakers, which is about 50 ml. These beakers are a little bit small, but I'm, using, I'm going with it. All right, so this is a semi-quantitative test. It's maybe more qualitative. Really, it's qualitative, meaning I'm not too concerned about the amounts. In the past, I did make it quantitative where we tried to measure the mass solubility. So we would put the beaker with the water on a scale, zero the scale, and then add a little bit of substance, um, a little bit at a time and, and still until no more dissolved. But it's not necessary and it takes a long time. And for some, some students at this level, it just slows down the whole thing. So all we really need to know is whether it is soluble or not. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take one scoop at a time and add it and then mix it and then see if it dissolves. So this is substance A. <clears throat> it looks like it is dissolving. Definitely is. As long as it's dissolving, it's soluble. Um, I like to add at least two scoops just to see, just to compare if I have two of them that dissolve, if one might be more soluble than the other. Now, in between scoops, I'm going to wipe and dry my spoon. Always a good practice to avoid cross-contamination. Again, scoops is a very subjective or somewhat subjective measure. It's not very precise. And that's why this is more of a qualitative test than quantitative. It's not so much about the number, it's just about does it dissolve or not. All right, we got two scoops to dissolve fully. So we know for sure A is soluble. Now, if you've done the homework or the reading or looked at the videos, then you know out of ionic, polar covalent, and non-polar covalent, two types of substances dissolve. One of them does not. So the fact that this dissolves is not a definitive test, but it can narrow it down. Now, substance B, I'm putting in there. It floats on the top. I'm going to try mixing it. Substance B does not dissolve, not one bit. It just stays there. So substance B is the one that does not dissolve, and that should be conclusive to tell us what substance B is. <clears throat> Therefore, we'd expect, because two of these types dissolve, and if substance B does not dissolve, we'd expect C to dissolve as well. Let me start with one scoop. Oh, yeah, pretty immediately see it's starting to dissolve. I spilled I spilled a little bit, but it's not a big deal. It's definitely dissolving. Yeah. Let 
There's one particularly big green that might take a little longer to dissolve, but the rest of it pretty much has dissolved. I'll add one more scoop just to make sure. So A is soluble in water, B is not soluble in water, and C is soluble in water. Definitely. It might, it does seem like it's taking a little bit longer, but it's soluble. The last test is a test for conductivity in solution. So there's one type of substance that can conduct electricity when it's dissolved in water. Now, one type of substance does not even dissolve in water at all. B did not dissolve, so we're not going to expect it to conduct electricity. We're still going to test it, though. So for this third test, we're going to use the conductivity meter. <clears throat> now, again, it's very important that you wipe your spoon in between making your solutions. Otherwise, otherwise you can cross-contaminate. And that means you can get incorrect results, especially for this last test. So for this third test, we are using a conductivity meter or conductivity tester. I'm not too concerned about the units right now. We just call this a one to 10 scale. And there are two buttons. The red one tests to see if the meter is actually working. Sorry, the black tests to see the meter is working and the red test to see there's conduction of the substance inside it. Let's check this by putting some clean water in. Water should not have a detectable level of conductivity. So the black button, there's no deflection on the needle. The red one just shows that we know it's working. All right, so, <clears throat> Just to illustrate a point, I'm going to start with C. So this is substance C. We're going to pour enough to fill up the meter. We're going to test to see if it's working by pressing the red button. Sorry, the black button to test if it's working. The red button, sorry. The red button tests if it's working. The black button measures the conductivity and it's going off the scale. So it's on a 1 to 10, 0 to 10 scale, this is 10. It is very conductive. Definitely conducts electricity. The solution of C. Now, I just emptied it out. And now I'm going to add the solution with B, which isn't even a solution because B didn't even dissolve. But I'm going to show you something. Again, I test to see if it's working with the, the red test if it's working. The black is supposed to check the conductivity. I am getting a deflection. It's a small one. It's less than one on a zero to ten scale. But B did not even dissolve, so B should not give me any conductivity. Why is it giving me a deflection? Because I didn't wash it out properly. So I cross-contaminated. So if I instead rinse this out with just plain water a couple times, and then I try my solution from B, now when I press the black, I get very little deflection. It's still a tiny bit, but it's practically zero. So that's important of avoiding cross-contamination by rinsing out the test the meter in between. Now we'll test A, substance A. It's working, but does it conduct? Again, just the slightest deflection, but practically zero. So we'll just call it zero. And that's the end. Then we clean up. One thing to keep in mind is that one of the substances I use 
sometimes is Epsom salts, which is a laxative. So you definitely want to make sure you clean your hands, wash your hands with soap, and do not eat ever. Do not eat in the chemistry lab. And you make sure you wash your hands before you go have lunch or anything like that. We'll discard the foil and all solids in the bin. We will drain any undissolved solid with the strainer and throw solids in the bin, liquids down the sink. And we're done with this part of the lab.